Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to week five and the final week of our UNIV 391, um, the COVID-19, the Mason Impact course. We are glad you are here with us. Um, we know that if you're in anywhere on the East Coast and especially in the DC area, you probably are getting storms as we speak. Um, and so um, if you wind up losing, um, losing power and having to log off and log back on, we totally understand and the link will rework for you. Um, we are all experiencing those storms too so if you see one of us disappear and come back um, it's because power is flickering where we where, where we are um, but barring that we are thrilled that you are here and excited about today's um, today's um, topic about models and, and analysis um, that will help understand some of the ways that people have been talking about how you analyze and compare what's happening in the um, in the epidemic so far, in the pandemic so far. Um, before we get started with that, just a couple of reminders. This is the last week of classes. Um, you need to have at least nine um, responses that are satisfactory to be able to complete the class. If you are at seven, a reminder to do, make sure you do today's and tomorrow's um, to, and, and do a good job on them to be able to make sure you're, you're meeting that. If you get 10 or more, you get a badge for the class. So you can also make sure you're, you're completing those. And these last two are going to be fascinating um, and really relevant to you. So I, I, I expect that will be a fun assignment and not a hard assignment. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind you is tomorrow's speech um, speakers are going to be Julie Zobel, who's in charge of Mason's emergency management, um, and Lisa Park, who's the university physician, and they've been leading our emergency response, and our conversation will be about the safe return to campus. Um, so it is directly relevant to your experience, and the other thing I wanted to make absolutely sure you do before class tomorrow is the, um, the student safe return to campus training is now available on the website. And we expect you to take that before the session tomorrow. And it doesn't matter if you're really returning to campus or if you're gonna be working remotely during the semester, it, partly because we want you to be able to talk tomorrow and be a part of the conversation about what we're doing about a safe return to campus and how we think about doing a safe return to campus. So I want every one of you to take the safe return to campus training but I want you to think of it from an inside outside perspective, both what are we talking about, like what do you need to know to be to, to safely come back to campus and what are your responsibilities and the campus responsibilities for that. But also think about everything we've talked about through the class so far and how that has gone into making messages um, that help get students thinking about how to return safely. And there's several really good readings that are directly relevant, including what kind of things have been happening at other campuses already this summer as people have been coming back. So important to remember and make sure that you take that training before you begin um, class. So um, today I wanted to um, introduce you to three of my favorite people. I am, I am actually not that much of a secret um, modeler and computational scientist myself. I really enjoy looking at and using models as a way of understanding. I, I study human biology, cemeteries, and the evolution of infectious diseases over a long period of time. Um, and one of the ways I do that is through modeling um, in comparison of models to the grounded data that I use. Um, and so I was really excited that our three speakers all were willing to come today and talk about how they are able to use models and that kind of analysis of data to be able to understand the larger patterns of what's going on with COVID-19. Um, our three speakers, our first speaker today is um, Dr. Lee McHugh. She's an associate professor in mechanical engineering. Um, our second speaker today is going to be Dieter Foser. He's the professor and chair of the Department of Geography and Geoinformation Systems. And our third speaker today is going to be um, Dr. Robert Axtell. Rob is a professor of computational data sciences and Rob, if I'm right, economic sciences or, or economics, yeah. right? Um, and so they each have been working on models that are being used by professionals um, and, and decision makers around the country in the COVID-19 response. And the papers today that you had as pre-reads were really interesting, especially at the time each of them were published and what kind of information they each gave and how they've informed even the decisions you've been hearing about through the semester. So with that, I'm really excited. I'm gonna turn it over to Lee, to you first. Thank you for being here. And I'll let you hand over to each other and then Rob, I'll come in at the end. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Usher. So just to confirm you hear me okay and see my slides, correct? Excellent. 
Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Lee McHugh. Uh, I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering and we titled this se session with the three of us why model. Uh, so why model my team and I have done quite a bit of modeling. I'm actually a ship dynamics person. Um, so I've got kind of some greatest hits here on this slide. Um, I had a student who is doing some very classic dynamic systems verification and validation. That's what BNV is short for over here. I'm looking at how you would validate codes that are or are for a chaotic system. So chaotic systems classically present themselves where a really, really small perturbation can result in a totally different end result. So for my field, when it's ship dynamics, that means that a really small change in how a wave maybe hits a, hits a vessel might be the difference between it capsizing, so it rolling over and it being fine. Um, I had another student who was diving into models for roll damping. So again, trying to figure out when something capsizes, how you model the, the damping of the motion as it rolls side to side can make a huge difference. So he was playing with using fractional differential equations instead of ordinary differential equations to model the damping of, of a boat rolling. I had another student, um, we jokingly called this project our interplanetary flying dolphin. So we said, well, you know, boats are cool on Earth, why not do them on Europa? And so we were looking at how you would create a mission profile to look at under ice exploration on one of the moons of Jupiter, Europa, if you were trying to look for life. Um, I have had students who have created some of the data sets that you would use for validation. So verification and validation, again, is key, where verification is making sure that your code does what you think it does, but validation is making sure that it's actually representing the physics that you're trying to model. Um, so I had a student who did a series of underwater explosions. My mouse just disappeared on me. Oh, so sloshing tank started first. I'm gonna pause this one. So this was a student who is doing uh, small ex explosions essentially underwater against a flexible membrane to look at how that membrane would deflect so that somebody who's trying to model the computational fluids may be trying to model um, what would happen if you had an explosion near uh, an air cushion vehicle, so a hovercraft that's got a rubber seal, what that would do dynamically. Um, and then I had another student who was creating some of those computational fluids models to try to simulate it. So this tank has a flexible membrane in the center and the tank itself is sloshing back and forth. And so as the water moves, that membrane is moving. Um, again, looking at this sort of flexible fluid structure interaction. And so this model is using what's called smooth particle hydrodynamics. So each of those water particles, each of those dots that you see sloshing back and forth is treated as just its own little particle of fluid that's got its own collection of properties and how strongly it influences other particles around it are, is governed by how close it is to those other particles. And we've used that sort of model to then extend beyond just computational fluids. Um, Stephanie Sherman, another student of mine, was looking at how you would use that sort of approach to model air traffic. And if you were looking at models for aircraft where you have a decentralized control model, so you don't have someone in a control tower telling each airplane or air, aircraft pilot what to do, you sort of have asserted all authority out to the pilots and the aircraft themselves. Um, to do deconfliction. And so she was using the same sort of philosophy, this particle based approach where every aircraft has its own set of particles, its own governing behavior and interacts with everybody else based on how close they are. So that might lead you to say, how does somebody who cares about ship dynamics and maybe some air traffic modeling get involved in COVID-19 modeling efforts? So just sort of the walkthrough of how my march went down. Um, Mason's spring break for 2020, uh, on March 5th, so just before spring break, the university suspended all international university sponsored student travel. I was scheduled to be going to Panama and Colombia for, for Mason business um, starting on March 8th. So I did you know, walk across campus after I got that email on the 5th saying that the university was, was suspending student travel and said, do y'all still want me to go? They said, yep, you're not going to a high risk country. You're not traveling with students, you're fine feel free to make your trip. So March 8th, I departed Dulles for Panama. Um, March 10th, university suspends all travel, effective March 16th. And so March 10th, I actually was departing Panama for Cartagena, Colombia, the second leg of my trip. 
On March 12th, the governor prohibited all out-of-state travel for Commonwealth employees. March 12th was the day I was supposed to go from Cartagena to Barranquilla, Colombia, and I was scheduled to return from Barranquilla on March 14th. But on March 11th, seeing these university emails coming out, getting notices from, from the State Department and their representatives in Colombia, I decided to hop an earlier flight from Dulles um, back home from Cartagena directly uh, via Panama to Dulles. Um, so March 11th was the day that I left Columbia. It also happened to be the day that the WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Um, a few days later, Columbia closed its borders. So all this time, actually, I was texting with my husband while I was on travel and he was saying, oh, you're overreacting. Don't worry. Enjoy your trip. Um, March 16th, Columbia closed its borders. Panama restricted entry to citizens and residents. So I felt that it was wise that I had gone ahead and gotten home. And March 22, Panama actually suspended all international flights. So this got me, you know, more interested in what was going on in the world. And so you might also say, why would I conceivably go to Colombia and Panama at the start of pandemic? This was actually a meeting I was having with some Colombian naval folks in, in Cotec Mar, which is a nonprofit research and development company in Colombia, talking about planning a study abroad opportunity for Mason students under the Mason Geo program. So don't ever doubt your professors and, and industry members' dedication to developing educational opportunities for you, even in a pandemic. People were still meeting to try to make sure we have plans for a good study abroad opportunity for you when, when the world reopens. But so I'm boarding my first flight at the start of this pandemic, and I noticed the under the armrest in the row of seats in front of me, there was cash under the armrest. And I thought to myself, okay, you know, they've been talking up how airlines are doing increased cleaning. Clearly, this plane hasn't been cleaned because no cleaner would leave cash in plain sight under an armrest. So I had packed Clorox wipes and hand sanitizer, and so I'm sort of thinking, I hope I packed enough of this stuff. And I'm just watching people as they're boarding. This was before people thought that wearing masks was, was a good thing. So pretty much nobody's wearing masks. Um, people are touching everything. And you know, I sort of quickly realized I definitely did not want the in-flight snack. Um, I didn't want to touch anything the flight attendants had been touching. Um, but I, it's got me thinking, you know, how quickly could something spread through this airplane by contact? Um, and being somebody who does modeling and does models that have this particle-based approach, I thought, well, hmm, I wonder if I can model this in an SPH-like manner. And I know being a computational fluids person, I had seen a lot of really fascinating research in the past of people who look at aerosolized flows and you know what happens when somebody coughs in one row of an airplane and it flows back through multiple seats. Um, I was trying to kind of go the other end of the spectrum. I wasn't trying to look at that really, really detailed um, high fidelity work of what happens you know, with a single sneeze at, at great detail. Instead, I was sort of trying to think what happens when this person touches every armrest as they walk back the length of the, of the plane? Um, how does this sort of potential contact spread? Because also at the time we thought that COVID was living for long periods of time on solid surfaces. Um, and so this sort of contact spread was something that people were really worried about. So I tried putting together this really simple model, no aerosolized flow is purely tracking contact and proximity with no movement through the cabin. So just where somebody sat, if they were sick, you know, how close were they to other people? How healthy were those other people they were around? And how, and how often do we clean the plane in between flights? So no consideration for flight length, very computationally efficient though. And all really governed by this kind of bell curve relationship between the distance between an individual and any given sick passenger. So I looked at this for a hypothetical flight um, and had an initial flight where there were three sick passengers, which are the red X marks that you see on this. And it resulted with the simplified model and the infection of 13 others, which are the red dots. And so 16 seats of sick and infected passengers were viewed as contaminated. When you extend that then into multiple flights, I said, okay, well, if I've got those 16 seats that were, that were infected or that were contaminated, we don't clean after that flight, who else is then sitting in those seats and who else might get infected? So now the red open circles are seats that have been, been deemed as contaminated and red dots are additional people who become sick over the second, third, and fourth flights. So over this four flight sequence, we end up with 55 infections. So what can you get out of a model that's this simple? 
Well, so the upside to it is you can randomize a number of things. And so in this model, the number of passengers on any given flight was randomized. The number of sick passengers aboard any given flight was randomized. Where those passengers were sitting on each flight was randomized, including the sick individuals. Um, baseline health of passengers on each flight was randomized. So you could account for the fact that some people are going to be higher risk, lower risk. Um, and then you can start to assess whether or not um, interventions work. And so people were like me carrying Clorox wipes and wiping down their seat. Does that actually help? Airlines were starting to talk about not seating people in middle seats. So how much would that help? And so you can do these sorts of Monte Carlo simulations. You can do huge numbers of parameter sweeps with many, many, many stochastic variables, many random variables um, to try to assess how effective these interventions are. So on the left hand side here, I've got a figure where I did an eight flight sequence. We use every middle seat, no one wipes down their seat and I ran 10,000 iterations of it. So it's essentially 80,000 flights that are captured in this figure. And 98.5% of the simulations resulted in more than 10 infections. So that was this vertical red line is where the 10 infection number would be. You can see the vast majority of the cases ended up being where there were more than 10 infections. Conversely, when I do the same eight flight sequence, don't use middle seats, presume everyone wipes down their seat. Now I've got only 10% of the simulations resulting in more than 10 infections. So even though this model isn't high enough fidelity to say, you know, it's actually going to be this many people who are infected, it gives enough information to be able to, to assess an intervention and say whether or not we think that this intervention is actually going to be effective. So what do I do with that? Well, I kind of described this as a rabbit hole that I went down. Again, I'm a modeling person. I'm not a, I'm not a virologist. I, I didn't have any background in COVID or, or other disease spread modeling. But I was chatting with a friend of mine who is an epidemiologist who I work with on fishing vessel safety work. Um, and I mentioned this to her. And she said, well, that's really interesting. The center that she, that she runs not only cares about fishing vessel safety, but they also care about farm safety. And she said, well, could we do something similar then for farm workers? So 10% of crop workers in the US enter on H2A visas and employers have to provide housing for those workers. And also because many farm workers, even if they're not entering on H2A visas, are a migrant workforce, often in remote areas, it's not uncommon for employers to be providing housing for their workforce. Um, so for the safety of those workers and the security of the food pipeline, we need ways to help educate farm owners and workers on ways to stay safe with a dormitory style workforce housing. So we ended up doing a very similar model for farm workers who were living in, in a dormitory style environment. So for evenings, again, it was proximity based, just like this airplane model. Everybody's got a random baseline health. So some people might be more healthy. Some people might be less healthy. Everyone's randomly assigned to a bed. We introduce one sick resident into that situation. If the individual, if any individual becomes infected in the evening, um, they are given a random number of days for which they are asymptomatic. And that's pre under predefined guidelines. We start off with a uniform distribution of everyone who was sick for somewhere between two and 14 days. And we've actually been tweaking this to, to more accurately reflect um, more of a bell curve and, and with mean and standard deviation that more closely resemble COVID statistics. Um, so that's what we have in the model for the evenings. For the daytime, we use an SIR type model, which I'll go into in a second. Um, so we presume that that one sick person who was introduced on that first night shows up at work, their temperature's taken, they're identified as sick, they're removed to quarantine, um, but they have potentially infected somebody else on that first night. And so the daytime SRI model lets uh, the infection potentially spread amongst the workforce until people have moved from infected to being, from asymptomatic to symptomatic and are then removed from the simulation. So the bed locations of any infected individuals are randomly assigned. And again, as, as more people become infected, they're given an asymptomatic number of days um, based on those predefined guidelines. So SIR models, this is what you see a lot of when you hear people talking about flattening the curve. So S stands for susceptible, I is infected and R is removed. So when you add SI and R together, you should have 100% of the population. N is the total number of individuals. B is the infection rate and gamma is the recovery rate. So it's one divided by the average duration of infection. Um, and this beta and gamma come together to, to give you an R naught value, which is also probably something that you've seen in the media quite a bit. 
There are a lot of variations to SIR models that have much more complexity. They'll allow for births and deaths and reinfection and so on. Um, we kept it pretty simple here. The catch with this model is most of the SIR models that you see, um, if you see they're common models that you can find online, um, but they're often working, looking at thousands of people, populations of thousands. And I'm trying to look at populations of like five to 10 people. Um, so I can't have fractions of people in, in the model. Uh, so I had to do a few little tweaks to the SIR model in order to have only integer people instead of fractional people. Um, but so to model alone is not sufficient. You also need to think through who your target audience is and how you're going to communicate the information. So this is, again, why I really, really value working with epidemiologists and people from differing perspectives. So the farm housing work, the goal was to provide an educational tool for farm owners and workers. And so by working with this team that I, that I collaborate with, um, who have medical and epidemiological backgrounds and who know farm workers, who actually have farm workers on their staff, um, you can get a much better sense of what the end user needs. So we pretty quickly concluded what the end user didn't need was a MATLAB script. And what they did need was a website that they could, that they could plug in some basic numbers um, and get a sense for what they could do to change behavior in order to increase, um, to increase safety. So we ended up writing, rewriting the script in JavaScript so it could run in browser, it could be mobile friendly. Um, we added language and graphics to be clear um, and much more descriptive and we made it multilingual. So adding a Spanish version of the website was also really important to make sure that our end users would be able to see it. So where we started was this MATLAB script. Um, There's a couple scripts, uh, but you know, it makes sense to me and I don't think it would make sense to anybody else. And what we have right now live on the website is something that walks people through kind of a sequence of questions. Um, you all are probably of the too long didn't read generation though. And, and so as you know, there's a lot of words here, not much graphics. And so what we're actually going toward is something that is much more um, aesthetically pleasing and easier to work with. It really clearly lays out kind of step one of what you need to enter, step two of what you need to enter, describes what we're talking about with how people are sleeping in bunk beds, what the layout looks like, who's getting sick. And instead of trying to give a description at the end that talks about Monte Carlo simulation, just tries to tell people pretty concisely what their worst case scenario looks like. So why model? Even with low fidelity models like this, um, with high computational efficiency, you can still use this to evaluate mitigation strategies. And you can do a lot of what if type scenarios. Um, and you can expand this. So where I'm trying to take this is to look at full air travel networks. So not just look at what happens on one plane, but look at what happens on a fleet of planes going through hubs and the person who goes and gets Starbucks before they go get on their second flight and so on. You can start considering multiple farms with farm workers who travel between work sites and the food chain beyond the farms, hospitals, schools, ships, et cetera. There's, this problem is very um, kind of a similar setup to a lot of different physical situations. But we do need validation data to take this from being an intervention assessment tool, an educational tool, to something that actually is predictive modeling. And it's hard to find um, that sort of validation data that looks at you know, everybody who's traveled through O'Hare Airport on a given day. Um, so that is my story as to how a ship dynamicist doing planning work for study abroad in Colombia and Panama ends up modeling viral spread on farms. And I think that's my last slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Foser. All right, thanks very much. It was very interesting and I think it's, I'm not sure if you can make a perfect transition, but uh, what my goal is in my talk is actually to talk about how students are affected by all this and by when meeting your fellow students in class, what does it mean or what could it mean? So let's see. Slide is up. Can you guys see it? Hope so. So, um, so my my journey was a bit um, was a bit was a bit different to uh, to Lee's journey, in the sense that I was just asked at um, through you know somebody uh, Bethany actually Dr. Usher read a paper about contact network at universities, so students being on campus and meeting each other, running into each other. Um, and there was a publication on that from another university, I believe it was Cornell, 
and how um, these these kind of interactions on the university campus how this potentially would affect um, the spread of the virus at the university and yeah although I didn't have any I didn't had didn't have any previous work on that I found it a very interesting data driven challenge so digging into data sets um, from the university and inferring something that could be actually meaningful to the university. And I think at the end, it actually turned out that it was useful and, and you know, some of the decisions the university takes or took actually were influenced by, by some of those results. So um, let's see, uh, a brief background. Uh, so, I'm, so my background is actually I'm a computer scientist and um, right now I'm um, a professor in GEO, also in geography and geo information science because most of my work is in relation to spatial data sets. So, I, I like everything that has to do with coordinates and locations and um, trajectories. So tracing or tracking people in, in a good sense, like vehicles and inferring traffic conditions and the likes. So this, this is kind of, this is kind of my, my research cup of tea. So it's, I'm a data person and a lot of my work is in relation to urban science, mobility analytics, and, and just in a nutshell to get a better understanding of what people are doing. And so why do people go from one place to the other? What are certain commuting patterns? Why tourists explore a city in a certain way? So that's really from, from an application angle, that's kind of my work. Now, in my work, what became, or what becomes increasingly important is that although we have a lot of data that describes um, the behavior of, of the population, sometimes you don't have enough of, the, uh, enough of data. And what, what's really helpful is actually using uh, agent-based modeling, and Dr. Axler is gonna talk more about that, to actually complement your, your data mining and your data analytics um, work. So if you're kind of short of data, well, it might be a good idea to complement your, your gaps in your data with an agent-based model and, and come up with meaningful results. And this is kind of where my research is going. So in that sense, this work is not, is not um, that unrelated as I initially thought. Um, also in terms of teaching, so my teaching at the university is in relation to web applications. So what Lee, um, said before about you always have to communicate your results so right the most ingenious insights and, and scientific results are meaningless if you cannot communicate it and not everybody bothers to read a scientific paper because some of them are overly complicated uh, but everybody looks at visualization so whenever you see video and it takes you you know i'm not talking about tiktok but i'm talking about uh you know youtube videos or khan academy i'm sure many of you have used khan academy in high school uh, this is the way of communicating information. And in, from my perspective, web applications, web animation, so actually quote unquote videos that people can interact with and where people can manipulate the data, that's a very, that's a very interesting thing. And so one of my teaching, one of my courses that I teach is on web applications, so how to build web mappings, web map applications, something like Google, Google Maps, but on your own with your own data and your own functionality. And the other big thing I'm te um, the other course I'm teaching is on data management. Um, so let's talk about the particular challenge. So as long, in a nutshell, as long as we don't have a virus, as, as long as we don't have an, a vaccine, the only thing we can actually do to prevent um, getting sick is really, you know, the classical thing. So it's, you know, clean your hands often, cough and sneeze, you know, in your um, elbow. Um, but wear masks and keep your distance. So practice social distancing and just be meticulous about a uh, clean work environment. Um, and this is also something that the university is advocating for the fall. So you will see that hopefully the, the kids uh, or the students that are on campus and the faculty that are on campus and the staff, they will all wear masks. They will all practice social distancing because as long as we don't have a vaccine, there is no other solution uh, to containing the virus. So, from 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 a campus perspective, I mean, this is you know happier times. I would say from from Mason actually, uh, this is how you would be on campus. So you would be roaming around, uh, go and have something to eat, socialize with your friends, and now and then also go to class. So what what I, since many of the things uh, we cannot control for, we don't really have precise information uh, about. One thing we can really control for is, or one thing we can really figure out easily is how many kids or how many students uh, go to class and how many classes do they take. So this is something there, we have databases for that at the university and this is something I could readily pull. And also keep in mind that classes, so taking a class is also a place where you are 
uh, close to somebody else for a longer period of time, which is also one of the important factors when it becomes when it gets to transmissions of uh, of uh, of COVID nineteen. So being around somebody close proximity for a long period of time. So that's kind of the hallmark of of typical face to face teaching. Now, so the question that I wanted to or that I was asked and that I wanted to answer is. So what are the characteristics of, of this classroom environment and essentially the GMU student network and how would it and how is it affected by course enrollment? So the questions the university had is, well, we, we have some large classes with like more than 200 students. So how much do those large classes actually affect the potential spread of the virus, right? And um, the data I was dealing with, also we looked at, at historic data from the fall semester, from last fall semester, and just to give you an idea of the magnitude of, of the enterprise and of the size of the university, just on Fairfax campus, so not considering Arlington, not considering science and tech in Manassas, um, we have 32,151 students that were enrolled in uh, 6,779 courses. So it's really, it's a sizable thing. So all the students map to courses and typically students take one more than one course, right? So this creates quite a sizable contact network just purely on, on classwork. Now in, in, in um, the model or in what I looked at, I didn't consider employees at all. So I didn't consider the actual teachers. Uh, I didn't consider staff, you know, um, dining facilities, dorms, uh, commuting, people take buses, public transport to come to university, et cetera. So this is all outside of, of what you're gonna hear afterwards, right? So for any, for any real model that you would, um, actually come up with for campus, that's also something that you have to consider. And you will see here afterwards from Dr. Axler what an ABM uh, could actually do to help also consider those aspects. So what I really want, what I want to talk about is really just 32,000 students in, in 6,000 roughly 800 courses. So how much basically uh, will you be in contact over uh, with, with other students? And the data that, that I pulled for this kind of exercise was really course information. So here you have a course, an accounting course, for example, that has enrolled students. Now, that's, the, that's not the data that I, wanna, that I wanna use, but what I wanna use, and let's see if the markup works, is that I have, I have a student here that takes the same course as the student here. So those two students will be in close proximity, let's say once or twice a week for uh, an hour each. And this kind of gives our, you know, gives a chance that, that if one of them is infected, that the virus could be, uh, that the other student could also be infected by, um, by COVID-19. So what, what we built or what I built actually is this kind of contact network. So students, they know each other, provided that they actually take a class together. Um, if you, if you um, then um, look at the, at the numbers or some high level characteristics of, of this data set, you find out that during a typical week, um, a typical student needs 171 other students. So this is, this is kind of the, the critical number here. So we, we basically are with 171 other students in classes, provided all the courses are face-to-face -face throughout one week. And, and that's kind of, you know, uh, there is no such thing as a typical student. And what you see on the right in this, in this chart is the different colleges that we have at the university. So we have business on top. The second row is um, the College of Education. So, you know, teachers. And you have uh, the School of Engineering at the bottom. But what's interesting is that if you're a student in the College of Education, then actually you're only in contact with 56 students. And the reason being that education students are um, taking smaller classes. Now, if you're a College of Science student, so if your major is something like math, uh, chemistry, physics, and so on, then um, you actually are taking larger classes. So your contact network is much larger. So you're in contact with 217 students. Now, Volgenar, so the School of Engineering down here, has similar numbers, right? So those are colleges with larger classes. So the students that take those majors are also in contact with more students. Now, what we did is now the following. Um, so Assuming that we have, you know, those are the number of courses that we that are offered at the university. Uh, what happens if we transition larger courses, like in this case, 200, so courses that have 200 or more students in them, to online, 
right? So let's take out these these large courses, transition them to online. How would it affect the degree of students? How would it affect the number of students that we are in contact with throughout in classes throughout the week? Well, interestingly, we only had in fall at least we only had 18 students. Oh, uh, sorry, 18 courses that had an enrollment of 200 or larger. Uh, and if you transition all those to online, then actually the average degrees or the average students that uh, we meet throughout the week drops to 138. So it goes from 171 to 138. And then, so what you see in this in this table is that you have the, the various rows with uh, 100. So transitioning all the courses that are 100 or larger online. So this would affect 77 courses. So this includes the 18 uh, from above as well. And then the degree drops to 107. Right. And if you take it to an extreme, and this is also, you know, this is this is something the university um, has considered. So if you transition all courses that are larger than 25 to online, this would affect 1610 courses. So and observe that we actually had in fall, we had 6800 courses. So we have many courses that actually have a smaller enrollment that are seminar style that are graduate courses, higher semester courses. So what would happen then is that the students we run into is only 24. So we go from 171 to 24, and this is a huge reduction, right? And this is some of the considerations that the university um, um, had when actually suggesting that some of the courses have to go online, some of them have to be uh, hybrid, and some of them uh, can still be face-to-face. -face. Now, this, the, what you see here is, is really just a visual representation from the table before. And it says, so you have to, on the x-axis, you, you have the class size. So transitioning in this case, um, what we have here, uh, all courses that are 200 or larger on to online, the degree of students, so the students that you meet drops to 138 and so on. So we have the same thing. And on the, in, the, in the extreme case, so every, all the courses larger than 25 transitioned, we have a degree of um, 20, meeting 24 students uh, per week in classes only. Now, um, and uh, I mentioned before, so different college or colleges are affected differently by, by kind of this reduction. And um, so we, we see that, for example, the College of Science by removing the 200 courses larger than 200 online, College of Science here has a reduction in this number of contacts from 217 to 170, right? So the larger, the colleges with the larger classes are disproportionately affected. Uh, education is hardly affected at all because most of the courses are small anyways. Now, the complete spreadsheet, what we have here is um, that moving all courses larger than 25 online, business students only run into 11 other students in, uh, in their classes throughout the week. Various uh, visual and performing arts students, interestingly, still run into 42 other students. That's probably because it's really hard to do dance uh, online, so they still have to go. Um, they still have to have face-to-face -face classes, right? So this is so depending on what type of student is, you are affected in a different way um, by by this kind of reduction in class size and moving courses online. Again, so this is a visual representation of the previous table. You have so my college is the College of Science. That's the yellow line. So by moving classes online here the 24, larger than 20, 25 students. So College of Science has somewhere here around 40 students or has a, a number of possible contacts throughout the week of 40, right? So in the other example is uh, education, which is done here. So education barely changes because education has smaller classes anyways. Uh, now, another interesting thing is of course, depending on what, uh, where you are in your studies. So if you're a freshman, if you do nothing and you just take face-to-face -face courses, freshmen are affected quite a bit by larger class sizes. So a typical freshman runs into 346 other students per week. So that's a huge number. Uh, whereas when you're a doctoral student, so a PhD student, then actually you just see 15 other students in your classes because you just take smaller classes of around 10 uh, or 10 to 20 students. And this is the same breakdown of uh, how reduction or moving uh, larger courses online affects the different types of students that we have on campus. And this is a graph, the graph representation. 
And before I get to the to the uh, most important chart, an interesting an interesting um, piece of information that we also found is that uh, we have a breakdown between morning or before p uh, 4 p.m. students and after 4 p.m. students. Well, essentially it means on this side we have undergraduate students and on this side we have grad students. So most of the grad students at the university are coming in in the afternoon because we have many working professionals that do part-time graduate degrees. So that's why grad courses are scheduled in the afternoon to give those students also a chance. Uh, and you have in the morning you have your, your undergraduate students. So you see that you're, you know, on a Monday, we would typically have 17,500 students coming or being on campus, either commuting or living on campus, if you would reduce class sizes, so would move all courses larger than 25 online, then this number would be reduced to 8,000 students, right? So this is also, it's still a huge number, but actually, as we will see, it, it has a huge effect on possibly meeting a student that is actually, that is infected. Uh, also, an interesting piece of information is that all the Fridays are less popular with uh, undergraduate students. They're absolutely unpopular with grad students. So on Friday, there are in not hardly any grad courses scheduled in the afternoon. Uh, and this is kind of, that's the, the most important chart. Um, and uh, I will take quite some, or a bit of time to, to explain what's going on here. Essentially what this chart tells you is that assuming you have a certain number of infected students on campus, and the total number of students that we have on campus is 32,000 at the university. Um, so let's assume we have 200 students that would be infected, so that have COVID-19, and that would transmit, um, that would be able to, to infect others and transmit the virus. Then what is the probability that you actually are, it's not the probability that you get infected, but it's the probability that you are in a class with one of those infected students, right? So orange, and it's, so assuming there are 200 infected students, the line we, or the, the, uh, the curve we have to look at is this one. So this curve tells us that depending on, on the number of students that we meet through a week, throughout the week, what is the probability that we meet one of the 200 infected students? Well, if we don't do anything, and if we don't, and if you have uh, all face-to-face -face classes, and an average student has meets 174 students throughout a week, then the probability that you meet one of the 200 infected students is actually something like 65%, right? So it's really high. So if you think about it, 200 students out of 32,000 are infected, the university would do nothing and it would just offer courses like we offered last year in fall, then the probability that in one week, in week one, that you meet one of the 200 infected students is 65%. And that's really high, right? So, I mean, we, we can all agree on that. So what do we do? What, do we, what does the university need to do in order to make this situation viable? Well, A, we wanna reduce this number here. So we wanna reduce the number of potential students that you meet face-to-face -face throughout the week. So this is moving courses online. This is what we do here. So this dotted line here, this dotted line here, tells us that we only have classes less than 25, less or equal to 25. So the number of students that we meet is 24. So assuming, same thing, assuming we have 200 infected students out of 32,000, but our class size suddenly is only 20, or is 25, and we only meet 24 students, then the probability that we meet one of the 200 infected students is actually somewhere around 15%, right? Now, keep in mind that this is just, this person would be in a class where you are also in there. So you have each week, you have a 15% probability that you meet one of those students, which again, you know, it's not good, I would say, right? It's pretty high. It doesn't mean that you get infected when you are in the same class, but you know, it's not a good thing either. So the other thing that we wanna do is actually keep the number of infected people down, right? So we wanna eliminate, um, and you know, that's when contract tracing comes into the picture. So assuming we only have, uh, 10 students that actually have the virus out of the 32 students. Uh, if we have class sizes of 25, then down here, your probability of meeting one of those infected students is something like 0.1%, right? So in this case, you have a 0.1% probability that one of the students in your class actually um, uh, is sick 
if we have 10 out of 32,000 uh, students and, you know, still considering social distancing, masks, um, and, you know, um, disinfecting classrooms and so on, the chances of actually, um, you know, getting the virus from this scenario is actually really, really uh, slim. So um, now, again, I have to say that this, it, it's really a very, uh, very basic study of taking the scenario from the fall semester and mapping it into, you know, contacts or students that are met in class. Uh, so in order to get a more realistic approach, you would have to do something more. And uh, Dr. Axler is going to talk about agent-based modeling now. So what if we could actually simulate dorms, um, you know, Johnson centers of food, food courts, classrooms, and so on, include also faculty, teachers, and staff in the simulation and build kind of a mini campus, um, so a digital twin of, of, of Mason and run an agent-based simulation. So that could be a nice, that could be a nice um, way of actually getting a more realistic scenario about what it means to be on campus and how likely it is that somebody would contract the virus at the university. So that's it from, from my part. So I just wanted to share this uh, insight, this data-driven insight with everybody. And I'm gonna hand it off to Rob to talk about agent-based modeling. Rob, you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. All right, so yeah, so uh, uh, the, the two early talks here, uh, nice to go into what I'm gonna talk about. And essentially, I'm gonna look at, I wanna uh, present large scale models of the pandemic that we're currently going through and uh, where Lee discussed models with like, you know, between, you know, a few hundred agents and Dieter's were, you know, a few thousand. We're gonna look really today at kind of nationwide, even kind of worldwide scale models, okay? So uh, here's a quick background for those of you who, I want to know kind of what it takes to build these kind of large scale models. My first degree is in engineering and then I went to Carnegie Mellon for a PhD uh, where I focused mostly on computing and economics. And then uh, at the Brookings Institution, which is what's called a think tank in downtown DC, uh, with, with some colleagues, uh, we pioneered the idea of agent-based modeling uh, back in the 90s uh, through a research center that we created there. Today I'm a professor at the, ex at the Santa Fe Institute also, which is a a center for uh, complex systems research. And, uh, and I've been at Mason now for 14 years where uh, we have, we, we, we created the world's first department of computational social science. Uh, so we apply age-based modeling to stuff. And what is the stuff? Well, it's almost, almost everything. We don't, we're not very, very uh, Catholic about uh, only applying it to some areas. We, if, if there's an area we can apply it, we apply it. And I'm gonna tell you what age-based modeling is about if you haven't seen it before. You've heard a little bit about it already, so we'll go through some details. But for example, we applied it to things like, you know, the financial crisis of the late uh, part of the last decade, um, how, how fisheries work, um, evolution of technology, labor markets, and I've written here in, in colored print um, how diseases spread and how the economy works. So we're going to talk about that uh, in the context of the pandemic. All right. Uh, I have this one, just one slide about why do we need models anyway? You've heard uh, lots of talks about COVID-19, about the the virus so far this semester, and probably many of them were model free, did not really have models in them. So I've written here this, you know, that we all use models all the time, whether it's a formal model or I've written in the first bullet here, a mental model. The mental model is something like, you know, how do I make a decision? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive uh, uh, to campus today. Um, how do I get there? That that's involves some kind of model, how the roads are, how the roads work. Or you might say, I'm gonna interact with some person. Should I say something to them? Well, they might get angry. I have a mental model of what causes someone to get angry maybe. So uh, we can have models either in our head or we can also have models that are supplemented by technology. And so these days, a lot of us get around with the GPS. And if you say, I wanna go from here to there and the GPS might give you three routes while well, you're, you're using a model basically based on how, how the traffic's gonna flow and what the, what the travel time will be. So um, there are many different ways we use models. And I just uh, I have the one bullet here about, um, about uh, you know, think about a medical example of somebody who's recently diagnosed with cancer all of a sudden we have to figure out which tissues to irradiate. Uh, that's gonna be, gonna be based on a formal model that the, uh, that the medical doctor uh, uses to figure out uh, 
what, what, what can be treated, what can't be treated. So in essence, all of us today uh, use models all the time. And I'm gonna talk now about a class of formal models. Um, uh, and these are gonna be, you know, I've written here the, you know, if you, if you had lived through the pandemic of 1918, maybe you have a model in your head about how, to, how, how, that, how that pandemic played out. None of us did that. Uh, so we have to, we can build, we can learn from that pandemic though, and we can build models to, to, uh, to, to move forward. Okay. So when it comes to pandemic modeling and particularly the current uh, situation, there are really two classes of models that have been widely, most widely disseminated. And you've heard version of them here earlier today. Um, uh, and so the first class, which we've talked about mostly so far are the transmission dynamic models. And these are the mathematical and other models that keep track of, you know, who's infected, who's, uh, who's exposed, who's sick, who's, uh, who's been, uh, who's recovered, et cetera. Now, typically these mathematical models make a lot of what I've termed here heroic assumptions, things like, you know, um, the population is well mixed. Everybody has the same probability of being infected or people are biologically similar. You know, there's no old people, no young people, there's no different immunocompetence kind of thing. So oftentimes mathematical models, while very useful, and you heard about SIR models, they also uh, have, have uh, Achilles heels associated with not permitting much heterogeneity. And so these agent-based models that I'm gonna show you in a minute have stepped in because we can, we can represent every person in the pandemic with a software agent, uh, so-called, and then we can have these agents be very heterogeneous based on, you know, they're young, they're old, they're immunocompetent, they're not. Uh, and then we can model the interactions between these, these agents. So it could be that, you know, somebody stays at home, well, they're not interacting with the same probability that somebody who's out and about uh, has. And so we're gonna model uh, not well mixed populations, all right? So this is the first class of models. I'm gonna show you some examples of this, some toy examples uh, for transmission. But now, much, now that we're, we're into the period where we've had you know, quite a, a large effects on the economy and the rest of our society of, these, of, these, uh, of the virus, uh, we can ask questions about you know, how bad is the economy gonna get? Uh, how long to recover? Um, what uh, are there gonna be long-term changes associated with how we work? Can we all work online, et cetera? And then there are even gonna be international effects. So I'm gonna talk about both kinds of models here as we, as we go forward. So first, um, some of you may have seen this, this, uh, this first model I'll discuss back in March. That model was associated with uh, a research group at Imperial College in London by uh, Ferguson et al. And it showed the importance of flattening the curve. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that here in a minute. The basic idea for the US was that um, without any attempt to flatten the curve, you could get into a realm where you had as many as 2 million people who, who would perish. Uh, but that if you could social distance, you could bring that number down into you know sub 100k range. Now we're already well above that, so we haven't been as effective as that model said. But uh, but at least we've avoided the, the this this much larger effect. Now, so this was an agent-based model uh, based on this research team's earlier work modeling uh, various kinds of flu. The so the flu that uh, H1N1 flu that happened earlier uh, in the in the in this century, and then also going back to 1918, they didn't work on that as well. And this model, in particular, this model got the attention of the White House Corona Task Force. And so that first lockdown that we all went through in March when Lee was saying she was you know, deciding whether to go internationally or not, uh, the policy that, that grew up out of uh, the initial, uh, you know, the initial uh, uh, kind of takeoff phase for the virus was basically largely, was based largely on this Ferguson model, all right? And I'll, I'll sh show you just some examples of that in a second, show you some, you know, some, some of the results from that. But, since that, since since we have the epidemic models running, we all have some sense now about how the virus ebbs and flows. There have been a whole variety of, of models about, about the economy, saying, you know, a benefit cost model says, uh, what does it uh, really cost if we're going to spend a bunch of money to keep people at home, et cetera? Uh, what is the uh, uh, cost of, uh, you know, wh what is the, the be what are the benefits and the costs associated with with abating the uh, the, the pandemic? Uh, mitigating the pandemic. And then we can look at things like, well, we can get demand shocks when people uh, are not going out to restaurants, supply shocks, when people can't go to work. And then what policies lead to uh, better outcomes? And in particular, what, let's look at differential impacts. So I want to just talk about those, these things in a little bit more detail here. So this is a plot from the original Ferguson paper from March, which is once again, it's a very large scale ABM designed to um, inform, you know, uh, you know, a large swath of time and a large number of people. And this is for the whole US. And what the black line shows is, now this is not deaths, rather this is gonna be how many people are gonna be in the ICU, which is of course a, an important measure when you have a limited capacity. The red line here refers to what is the entire US ICU capacity. Now, of course, in reality, you have, you have state by state uh, 
uh, limits here. And we knew, you know, we all know that in, you know, in April for time frame, New York was much more serious than, than Florida, but now Florida is much more, much more serious, et cetera. So the red line is just kind of the aggregate for the whole country. But notice that the black line, if, you, if we had not done anything, the black line would have grossly exceeded the ICU capacity. Uh, and uh, of course, things would, have, would, be, would be on the downside now, but we'd have a lot of, we'd have this, you know, several million people dead is, is, is the problem. So flattening the curve was all about getting us onto what, either the brown line or the, or the orange line or the green line by basically taking action to social distance. And we all know the, you know, the different uh, strategies that can be used for this now, it's, you know, staying home from work, wearing masks, et cetera. But this was the basic ABM rendered at the scale of the entire country. And they also did this for the UK as well. And many other uh, countries uh, did similar models for their own country. Okay, so I'm gonna just now, for those of you who have never seen an ABM before, I'm just gonna run an ABM. But I just wanna say that if you, uh, a good platform for running ABMs is called NetLogo. NetLogo is available for free on the website that I have here on these slides. And then if you go into the models library, when you download that logo, you can find a bunch of, a bunch of, a bunch of those models. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna quit this and I'm gonna pull up my, uh, my net logo model. I'm gonna have to go over now to share that, uh, share this model, which is, uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing the, um, uh, that PowerPoint and show now the net logo. Okay, so an nature based model, what we have is, we have a, a bunch of individual people. Uh, and they're all gonna be individual software agents. So here it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but we have green and blue and uh, yellow agents. We're gonna be in different states of whether they're gonna be immune or healthy or, or, or whatever. And uh, they're, they're positioned on a spatial landscape here. And we can do things like, you know, change the number of people. I can make it so there's not many people available or, or around or a large number of people just by pushing some buttons. I can change the infection rate, make it high or low. I'm gonna list that out with a low infection rate. I can change how long they're infected for, a long time or a short time. And when I turn this thing on, what's gonna happen is they're gonna all just start moving around and we're gonna see we have one sick person here initially, but that sick person is gonna infect other people. And uh, when, we, when we hit go, the go button here, now it's gonna run very fast and I apologize for it, it's gonna run probably too fast, but it's gonna run and we're gonna see a kind of a, either a, a takeoff in this, actually in this case, we have, we have no takeoff, the, the, the sick person did not cause an infection because we have a low infectious rate. I'm gonna set it up again, whoops. I'll set it up again, we have more sick people, whoops. Uh, set it up here with some sick people. We're not getting any sick people. We'll get trouble. Set up and uh, let's increase the infections a little bit. Set up and uh, go. And I apologize. This is another case with not many people. The duration of the sickness is too short. So set it up here. There's one sick person go. It caused a bunch of people to get sick. And so what the plots are showing on the um, down here in the bottom is just showing. You know, we had a decline in the number of people who were healthy, increased number of people who were sick. At this point, we were down to a very low population. This is the case of a very, you know, a very bad pathogen that's going to wipe out a lot of the population. Now, of course, in reality, the one we're dealing with right now is not so bad, but this is just an illustration of, of an infectious disease model in that logo, and we, where we can model you know, a few thousand agents. So here we have a thousand agents running uh, over time. You can see how it works. Now, what I want you to think about is, is now, think about a model like this, but for the whole country. And that's what we're going to talk about here in the, in the last minute or two that I have, the last few minutes I have. So I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to sharing my PowerPoint slides. And uh, so once again, the two, the two classes of models were these virus transmission ABMs, but then more recently uh, getting into the uh, models of economic effects. And so I just a quick summary on these models is, and uh, now these models are rendered at large scale, as I mentioned, for the whole country. I'm not going to show them. But there are kind of round model different kinds of things like, for example, on the demand side, when people are not going on vacation, when they're not going to be going to restaurants, that, that suppresses the demand for goods and that sh that's a shock to the economy. On the supply side, when, you know, when a meat packing plant somewhere gets shut down because half the workers are sick or when non-essential personnel can't go to work, they can't provide certain goods and services, so we're going to have supply side effects. And then, of course, when trade gets shut down, you know, we, if we take no goods from Canada or if, or if China, uh, will take no goods from us or something. Europe won't take any goods from us, then that has, a, that has an international effect. So large scale agent-based models have been built now to study these things. How large? Well, the US private sector is roughly 120 million employees in 6 million firms. And we can model that entire thing these days because we have the data on how big they are, what the ages of the firms are, how many workers they have, et cetera. And so today we can really understand this giant shock that the economy is experiencing, which is something on the order of like, between 20 and 30 million unemployed people because every, every week in America, a million people are losing their jobs. 
we are going through some hiring right now, a lot of hiring. So about a million and a half people are being hired back, but we're still losing a million jobs a week. So we can try to keep track of all this. And um, I just uh, have a quick slide. For those of you who have a, some, a somewhat more technical background, I want to know a little bit more, more about the computer science. Here's kind of my one slide about this is that um, when you have a, a multi-core machine, which is almost all of our laptops these days have multiple cores, well, a big workstation has 100 cores, a supercomputer might have you know, 10,000 cores. What we do is we just break these large populations up into little pieces, put each piece on one of the cores, let it run for a while, and then rearrange the agents so that the ones who are kind of close together are on the same core. And with this kind of parallel computing, we can, we can realize very large scale models, in fact. And so these models are being used today to support policy. And I've written here just, you know, what uh, the, the current tension in policy today is, how can we have, uh, uh, policies that avert medical disaster, like the like the millions of dead we had we saw in the Ferguson model, but also avert economic disaster with with if in fact in fact the entire economy is shut down. So there is this kind of thread the needle. We want just enough opening, but not enough to cause uh, cause outbreaks and cause the pandemic to get you know to to create hot spots. So the only way to answer these these policy questions is with models today. I mean, there's no way you can just use the back of the envelope or use your intuition to, to, to do it that way. If you do it, you're gonna get the wrong answer. But of course, the US is, a, I've written here, a large heterogeneous place and no one policy always produces the right answer for everybody. So you produce all kinds of social frictions. And of course, state boundaries are porous, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, the good news is that these days, uh, many different institutions from local school districts to companies to universities, as we've seen with, with Dieter's presentation, Counties, uh, uh, airlines, in the case of of, of, um, of the first presentation, the, the states, et cetera, all these models are built to support policy. You know, what should be done? Should we open the schools? Yes or no? If we open them, how should we open them, et cetera? So these days, there's there's literally thousands of these models being built to support particular kinds of applications. And I'll finish up here by just saying the summary is that uh, is that these models are ubiquitous at this point. Um, ABMs used for making policy. Uh, everybody uses models, but the, particularly these formal models through ABM, these are the way that uh, all the work is being done to model uh, what's happening in our country today. Now, if in fact you would be interested in learning more about the kind of the research state of the art, I've just gone through quickly here in 15, 20 minutes, um, kind of the current, uh, the current uh, state of the state of play. But every Friday uh, in my department, uh, I run what's called the Mason Online Pandemic Modeling Seminar. Now, this was just the generic modeling seminar for my department held every Friday afternoon. But in March, we pivoted over to, to having it be uh, only modeling pandemics. And so we have the world's most uh, well-known researchers on epidemiology, on the economy, on all the other dimensions of the uh, pandemic uh, come on and they, and they give us an entire you know, hour lecture on what they're doing, how they model, et cetera. If you would like to be added to that uh, distribution list, email Karen Underwood, whose, whose email address appears here at the very bottom, and I'll leave this on the screen. Uh, and she will add you to the announcement list. These will continue through the summer and, or, and then in the fall. And as I said, we're, we have um, a, a regular uh, cast of characters coming through here who are some of the world's leaders on, uh, on how, to, how to build models that are relevant uh, for policy to try to uh, bring us to a better outcome than we would without the models. Okay, so I'll stop there, turn it back over, and we can have time for Q&A, hopefully.